Welcome and aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today we'll cross the sea on the deck of maritime law. On deck with me today are Mark Coberly and Michael Nakano. We will discuss the contemporary practice of maritime law and current events that make that practice which has been awash in the history of ocean-going vessels, constant and compelling in the present day. However, before we jump into our discussion of this specialty law practice, Mark and Mike, I'd like to welcome you and ask you to please introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about your background, what you do, where you work, and how that is all connected with maritime law. So, Mark. Welcome. Well, thanks for having us. Um, so my title is Senior Claims Adjuster, and I've been a claims adjuster since the mid-80s, um, starting with uh, handling workers' compensation claims in uh, California. And in the mid-90s, I was first introduced to um, federal laws under the USLNH, the Longshore and Harbor Workers' Compensation Act, as well as General Maritime and Jones Act. And currently, that's what I do now specifically, is handle claims um, that involved uh, seamen working on board vessels, as well as passenger claims. So it's all bodily injury claims where they're, where they're working primarily or on board a vessel. It's on the sea. It's on the sea. OK, and what firm are you with? So I work for Asgard Summit Management Services. We are a Charles Taylor company, which is a UK-based uh, company. And uh, here in the United States, we specialize in maritime claims. So an international company. Okay. Correct. All right. Yes. So Mike, how about you? What, what, what's, what, what, what do you do? Where do you work? What, what is, how is it connected with maritime law? Well, I born and raised here. I uh, graduated from William S. Richardson Law School in 97. Since then, I've pretty much been doing primarily maritime law. Started out at a firm called Alcantara Frame. Right, uh, yeah. A lot of the old timers probably remember them. And I'm an old timer, <laughs> so I do remember them. <laughs> so they were, you know, they were the, the, the main admiralty firm in town. Um, started out there and currently with a firm called Cox, Wooten, Lerner, Griffin, and Hansen. Um, again, we do primarily maritime law. Um, that's Pretty much it. And, and you have offices around the we United have, States? So yeah, so uh, CWL for short. We have offices in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Honolulu. Okay, so across the sea. Correct, yeah, yeah, across okay. the sea. Okay, all right. Now, what is maritime law today? Where, where do we start? What, what, define it for us. So maritime law is the law that governs the uh, vessels on the open sea, or any navigable waters. So navigable waters is the, includes the open sea, inlets, rivers, lakes, bayous, so anywhere that a, that a vessel can navigate. If a seaman is injured on, on the course of that voyage, they would be entitled to recoveries under maritime law. I guess sort of to expand on that, you know, I get asked that question a lot. When people mm -hmm. ask me what I do, I tell them I'm an attorney, and they say, well, what kind of law do you practice? I say, maritime law. And it's always the same response. They always say, maritime law. That's interesting. What is maritime <laughs> law? And so what I generally tell them, I say, look, it's, it's any kind of law you have on land, but basically in a maritime context. So, you know, whether it's personal injury, contracts, contract disputes, things like that, uh, collections, you can pretty much find the same type of law and disputes on the mar in the maritime context. Okay. I, I have a question for each of you based on what you just told me. So, so Mark, I mean, navigable waters. I mean, how, how far up do we go? I mean, how far up do we go? Uh, what is that? If you're on the Mississippi River, do you go to the source? Or is there a, is there a, a definition we can rely on? Or? Well, once the... Uh, Essentially, when the, once the vessel departs, but certainly any incident or accident that occurs on the vessel, if the, the injured seaman, the injured person, can show that they were um, 
in the assistance of the navigation of the vessel or the mission of the vessel or serving in the mission of that particular voyage, they would be considered uh, a seaman, have seaman status. So it's quite broad in, in it, a way. It can be very broad, absolutely. So the engine, if, they, if it's a, the engine guy working on the engine and he's injured and he hurts himself, you know, fixing one of the, the engines, then certainly he would be entitled to recovery under, under general maritime law. So it sounds like it's more in the context of the ship itself than where it is. I mean, if you're on the ship, it, the, does it matter where you are? Or is, is it the law on the ship? It can, it can vary, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, for the most part, if the, if the injured seaman is working in the service of the vessel okay. or on the, for the mission of the vessel, then they would be entitled to uh, recoveries under general maritime law. Okay, okay. so Mike, my, my follow-up to you is, why do we need a separate law from the land law? I mean, how did that develop? Or, or what, is it an international type thing? Is it d different country by country? Or? So again, I, yes. So <laughs> more or less every country has its own maritime law. Oh, okay. um, the one, I guess, common denominator is, as far as I know, a lot of it comes from and originates from British maritime law. They were sort of, uh, you know, Hundreds right. of years ago, they ruled the seas. Right. They had all of the ships. They had the biggest navy. So well, it's, not, it's not surprising that British were the ones who developed the maritime law. And it was interesting because I was at a uh, seminar recently, an uh, international maritime law seminar in Singapore. And somebody brought up, said something very interesting in that, you know, the mar international maritime law developed because the British ruled the seas. Um, in this day and age, they don't have the most tonnage. They don't have the most ships. They don't have the biggest navy. Yet the com comment was that the Brits have managed to maintain their hold on maritime law. And what I mean by that is, you know, obviously, we've got a lot of uh, traffic, international commerce going back and forth. And Oddly enough, a lot of when a dispute arises, the contracts, a lot of them state that they'll be uh, resolved through London arbitration with the English barristers and solicitors. So you could have, uh, the, in Singapore, they were complaining you have two Singaporean companies that are fighting over it, but they've got to go to London to hash out their disputes because that's what the contract calls for. Uh -huh. So again, I think certainly our law is derived in large part from the British maritime law, and I think a lot of other countries have followed suit. Okay. Now, historically then, Britain was perhaps where maritime law began, and it dealing with things that happen on the ship. How have things changed historically to the modern day? What, what's happening, is, there, is it different now? than it was, say, in 1800 when King Kalakaua, in, in 1881 when he went around the world on a ship, a sailing ship? Are, thing, are things different from that time now? Well, I think one of the big uh, changes, you know, from the England maritime laws as it relates to the United States was uh, the passing of the Jones Act in 1920. Okay. And... Uh, the, uh, that, that's a U.S. law? That is a U.S. law. And so prior to the Jones Act, which is a cabotage law for the most part, but... What does that mean? It is, um, governs the transport of goods across the sea from one country to okay. another country. So the aspect of the Jones Act that Mike and I deal with specifically um, is geared towards uh, negligence and recovery of a seaman who's injured due to the negligence of... The, their employer or the ship owner. And uh, so prior to the Jones Act, uh, a seaman could only sue for unseaworthiness of a vessel. So if something went wrong on the vessel that caused their unseaworthiness, injury. Unseaworthiness, you're going to have to help me out, you folks. What does that mean? So a ship owner has a non-delegable -dele duty to provide a seaworthy vessel. In other words, that uh, the gear works they have a crew that is competent and able to perform the duties on board the vessel. Um, however, should something fail, then that would cause an unseaworthiness uh, or an unseaworthy vessel. And if that, whatever was that failed to function properly caused an accident or injury 
to a crew member, then potentially they could sue uh, the vessel owner for un due to unseaworthiness of the vessel. So that was, that was their remedy um, prior to the Jones Act. The Jones Act, when that passed, um, then they could sue for negligence um, besides unseaworthiness, Jones Act negligence, okay. that, the, that the ship owner um, was somehow negligent in causing or you know, the incident to happen. Okay. So Mike, what type of claims are we talking about? What's the difference then? between seaworthiness and negligence of involving the owner in the Jones Act? How do we? One, one of the big differences is the party who you can make a claim against. So Jones Act negligence is generally is, that's between the seaman and, and his or her employer. That's the, that's the relationship. Unseaworthiness is primarily with the seaman and the vessel. Oh, I see. It gets a little bit confusing <laughs> whether or not the employer owns the vessel right. or the employer doesn't own the vessel, um, and so that's sort of the, the, the big difference between the two. Okay, well that's interesting distinction that I never knew about. Uh, and, and you, you can actually think of the vessel as being an individual, a person. You can actually sue the vessel um, itself, and um, I could probably talk a little bit more about that, where they actually seize the vessel and... Well, that, that is a distinction from ordinary um, commercial law on land, land law, right? Where you treat the, treat the vessel kind of as a person in right. a way, right? Is that, is, that how it's, is that how it's viewed? Pretty much. I mean, it, I'll let Mike, <laughs> he's the lawyer, he can explain a little bit in more, better detail. Yeah, in short, yes. Um, in, under Admiralty and Maritime Law, you can bring what's called in rem claims which are directly against the vessel, in addition to your in personam claims against your, uh, the vessel owner or your employer. And I think that's one of the big distinctions between, as you pointed out, sort of land side law and okay. maritime law. So in a lawsuit, and I, I want to ask you in a minute what type of cases you handle, but in a lawsuit then uh, you have somebody that sues the vessel. Is that, is that what's happening? And then, or, or, if it's a claim involving some type of negligence, could sue the employer or under the Jones Act, who do you sue? Is that, is that I mean, who are the parties, I guess is, is my question. Well, again, it depends on what the cause of action is. If it is, falls under Jones Act, Jones, um, Act negligence, or if it falls under the unseaworthiness of the vessel. And so what I see more often than not is the seamen suing their employer who um, most of the cases that I have also own the vessels or a fleet of vessels. Okay. Yeah, I agree. And, and I guess in most cases, if, if we're talking about a seaman claim, they will sue the vessel owner, the employer, whether or not they are the same party or different parties. It's not as common to see in rem claims. Sometimes okay. we'll see a vessel named, but in order to actually, for the court to actually have jurisdiction over the vessel, it's very involved process. You can't just name the vessel. Um, unlike people, you, you have to have a way to serve the vessel. And in maritime law, the only way that's done and the only way the court gets jurisdiction over the vessel is if you go out and arrest it, um, which is a whole lengthy process. And that, and that would, where does that happen normally? What court are we talking about? So it'll, in REM claims, it has to be in federal court. Okay. Uh, you know, you know, the federal courts have original jurisdiction over admiralty and maritime claims. Okay. In rem claims are in admiralty, so they have to be brought there. So it, it basically, you know, you file your complaint and it's against in personam, against whoever individuals or corporations, plus you name the vessel. It's got to be a verified complaint. Um, and then, you know, you've got to file all of these other papers basically to get the court to issue a warrant of arrest for the vessel, which then is taken to the United States Marshal who goes out, goes to the vessel, and says to the captain or master, whoever is in charge, this vessel is now under arrest. They'll put a sticker up and say, you can't go anywhere, you can't leave until this vessel is released from arrest. Okay, and, and, and I want to take a break right now, short break. When we come back, I want to ask about why we needed the Jones Act. And have you guys uh, 
give me some explanation of, of what, what, what prompted that. And then I also would like to have you expand a little bit more on the type of cases you handle. But right now we'll take a break. I'll be back with Mark Coberly, Mike Nakano, in, in a minute. All right, thank you very much. Thanks to our ThinkTech underwriters and grantors, the Atherton Family Foundation, Carol Mon Lee and the Friends of ThinkTech, the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education, Collateral Analytics, the Cook Foundation, Duane Carisu, the Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners, Hawaii Energy, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, Hawaiian Electric Company, Integrated Security Technologies, Galen Ho of BAE Systems, Kamehameha Schools, MW Group Limited, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sydney Stern Memorial Trust, Volo Foundation, Yuriko J. Sugimura. Thanks so much to you all. Welcome back. I'm Mark Schlav, host of Law Across the Sea with Mark Coberly and Mike Nakano on deck with me. And we are talking about maritime law. And my question that I want you folks to talk about a little bit is, why did we get the Jones Act? Um, it sounds like we had some maritime law from Britain, but then in the United States, we did the Jones Act. Why, why did we need that? What was that about? Well, um, like I had mentioned earlier, um, prior to the Jones Act, the injured seamen really had no remedy against the vessel owner um, in the event that they were negligent in causing an, inju an injury uh, to them. So uh, the Jones Act provided that provision where they could sue the, uh, the ship owner, their employer, due to negligence in causing uh, the injury or accident and recover you know, damages for, for that. And so Congress kind of felt this was something that we should be added to the historic uh, law in Britain. Yeah, I, I also, yeah, I, I, I think that's one of the issue, one of the reasons, um, and I think you know something as Mark previously mentioned. I think a, a part that of the Jones Act that especially us here in Hawaii are more familiar with is the cabotage part of it, which means you know basically uh, ships sailing from U.S. port to U.S. port have to be U.S. flag vessels, U.S. built, U.S. seamen, um, and I think the reason for that was to you know to promote and encourage U.S. shipping, not only. Uh, to have a strong merchant marine, but also to keep the you know to encourage the shipbuilding, the ship shipbuilders um, in times of emergency or war. You know, the, I think the country felt they needed to have that you know, so resource. There's, there's kind of an economic background to it, also. Then it sounds like sure. Okay, all right. Now, what type of claims do you folks handle in your business daily? Uh, what type of uh, things do you see come across your desk? In, in the maritime law. Right. right. Well, so I would say that my caseload is split pretty much 50-50 between injured crew members. And here in Hawaii, that um, involves, you know, the captain or deckhands on some fishing vessels, uh, a lot of uh, recreational or um, like the catamarans, the uh, snorkel boats, the whale watching boats. Um, if any of the crew members are injured, um, and they can range from back injuries to crushing their finger or uh, uh, falling and hitting their head, things like that. Um, also, unlike workers' compensation, if the, the crew member becomes ill and on board a vessel, then that's covered under general maritime, and the benefits that are paid to them are maintenance and cure. Maintenance and cure, that's a special word. Special words. Right. right. Okay. So unlike workers' compensation where they would pay temporary disability uh, for the time that they're off work, maintenance is a daily rate or a stipend paid to the injured seaman in lieu of room and board that they normally would have received while on the voyage. Okay. 
And so while they're recovering, they're entitled to maintenance payments. Um, and again, this is an old law that goes back, and it's typically for seamen who are on these long-term uh, voyages between countries or on fishing uh, voyages. But, but we applied this, the same law to captains on catamarans. So they get up in the morning, they go, they, they're on the boat for eight or nine hours on these different cruises, taking you know, passengers out to snorkel. And then if they're injured, the law still says that they're entitled to maintenance, even though they don't live on the vessel, they're still entitled to maintenance until they're no longer in need of curative treatment, that they've basically recovered from their, from their injury. And the cure is? And the cure is basically their medical treatment. I see. And is defined as curative treatment. Um, so treatment that is specifically f to cure them of the injury that they sustained, um, as opposed to perhaps palliative treatment. And there's certainly arguments of what is considered curative and palliative. And, and your firm would take care of the insurance coverage for that, is that right? Or, uh, so um, my firm, we're, we don't, we're not, I'm not with an insurance company, I'm just I'm a, a claims adjuster. And so a lot of the insurance companies are on the mainland, mm -hmm. um, some out of, out of London that write this type of insurance, uh, which is P&I uh, and &I coverage, protection and indemnity coverage. And so I'm the boots on the ground here in Hawaii. Oh, so I'm the one who ensures that the injured worker is receiving the maintenance and cure, coordinating the visits with the doctor, making sure the treatment is appropriate. Uh, if it's a, a specialty that we don't have here in Hawaii, sometimes I, we may have to send them wow. to, to the mainland for treatment. And it's not just injuries, again, it's illness. So if the, if the seaman had a stroke while on board yeah. or a heart attack while on board, or if they became ill and it, determined, and it was determined that they had cancer and cancer was diagnosed while they were on board the vessel, those illnesses wow. are covered under general maritime, under maintenance and cure. Wow. Wow, Mike. What how about you? What what are what are you? What's your standard uh, type of case, or is there such a thing? Is, you know, is it all over the map? Yeah. You know, we certainly handle a lot of maritime personal injury actions, like Mark. Uh, you know, crew member or passenger injuries. We also do again it, because if it's a small port, um, we also touch upon various other maritime law issues. So you know, we'll get the occasional cargo claim will get involved in contract disputes and end up arresting a vessel or defending a vessel that's been arrested. Um, you know, we'll salvage claims, things like that. Um, in some of the larger ports, you have law firms who specialize in one type of maritime law. But again, because this is a smaller port, we tend to touch upon more or less everything and anything. All right, the whole, the whole spectrum of types of cases. Right. And it's your normal client, uh, I guess it could be either a seaman or, owner or a, a, a ship owner, I, I suppose. It could be either one? or Well, generally we do uh, we represent vessel owners and okay. employers. Uh, we do insurance defense. We represent what are called P&I clubs. Um, they're okay. mutual insurers um, that insure the large shipping company. Okay. Now, there, I mean, we don't think about it too much, but there's been a couple maritime cases that have been in the news. And you don't, I mean, I, I think people, when they, they watch the news, they don't think that's a maritime law case. But we have the one where the diving ship caught fire, and about, I think, 34 people passed away. Uh, and then we had a, a container ship turn over. Do you have anything to add to those uh, Cases, or do you know? Is, is there some comments about those? That uh, how how does maritime law affect them, and what what are your thoughts about it? Where do they go with those cases? So I, I guess the most interesting thing about, and I, I haven't followed the uh, the car carrier that overturned um, as much. I think the um, the conception, the yeah, yeah. dive boat's been in the, the news a lot boat, more. Yeah, with the fire. Yeah. And uh, a lot of the stuff I've seen, at least in the press, is is discussions about the limitation action that's been filed. Yes. And what that is, is again, normally, as I said, we rep both Mark and I are on the side of, we represent the vessel owner or the employer, and we're usually representing the defendant in a lawsuit. Um, but if you notice this limitation action, it was filed by the vessel right, owners. Right, what's that about? So the Limitation Act is, it's an old 
uh, Act, and I think somebody mentioned it was pre-Civil War. I'm wow. not sure what the exact date was, but it entitles the, it, it provides a vehicle for the vessel owner to ex get exoneration or limit their liability to the value of the vessel. And I, I believe the origin of that was to encourage investment in shipping. Um, Again, this is background in, in the economy. Exactly. You, yeah, okay. you know, before big insurance and where you could get insurance, you know, they had to find a way to encourage people to invest in shipping. And one of the ways to do that was say, well, look, uh, we'll set up this act which allows you to limit your exposure to the value of the vessel at the conclusion of the voyage. Um, and basically that's what this is. Um, so the vessel owners went in, they filed a limitation action saying either, I, I haven't seen it, but you know, they're probably saying, you know, we either want to be exonerated from liability, we, we had nothing to do with it, or if there was some sort of negligence or unseaworthy condition, then we had what's called no privity or knowledge of it. And basically it, it wasn't the owner's fault. And therefore as owners, our liability is limited to the value of the vessel at the end of the voyage, which in this case is is nothing. Um, mm. I, I think there's been some recent, uh, more recently they've changed the law a bit, so there's a minimum. So there's a certain dollar amount that you have to post regardless, even if it's a total loss um, based mm. on the tonnage of the vessel. Wow. So that's, that's what's going on in that case. Mark, do you have anything to, to add to that? Uh, not really. I mean, <laughs> um, I watched, you know, I watched the news and I don't, I mean, I will say I'm glad it didn't happen in Hawaii, but yeah, yeah, I mean, it's sure. unfortunate that it happened at all. Yeah. But um, Okay, guys, now, you have about a minute left. Okay. Is there something about maritime law that catches you or that makes you feel good or makes you feel this is something interesting? What, is there something about maritime law that turns you on? Well, yeah. you know, uh, the cases are, you know, having handled workers' compensation and now handling uh, maritime cases, um, I just, the, the types of uh, exposures are so, are, can be very different. And as an adjuster, the investigation process of it and finding out the nuances and the details and, and how the law applies to that. I find it interesting, interesting. Yeah. And, okay. and kind of makes my job fun, makes I Makes it different, yeah. yeah. Okay, all right. Mark? Uh, Mike? Seriously? Uh, yeah. I, you know, I, I think, well, one, we're the only lawyers in town that get to still cite to, like, cases from the 1800s. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it, it, I think one of the things is the fact patterns that you see are always interesting. And, you know, I'll, I just remember saying to one of my partners recently, no, it's, you can't make this up. And every day you see stuff that you say, I've never seen that before. So it sounds from both of you, this is an interesting area of law. Maritime law is something that makes life as a professional uh, a little bit different Absolutely. And, and fun. Okay, well, thank you both very much for being here. I appreciate uh, getting the current events uh, of maritime law and how it affects us. And uh, thank you all. Uh, I am Mark Shklov. Uh, we are over for today and looking forward to our next program in a couple weeks. Aloha. Thank you to uh, Mark Coberly and Mike Nakano for today's show. Aloha. Thank you. Thank you.